Good morning, everyone. We are now about to start our next session of the Community Alliance Summit in track two. Um, my name is Celia Feinstein, and I'm a committee member of the Developmental Disabilities Council, and I welcome you this morning. Um, I'm going to just share a few housekeeping tips with you, and then I will go ahead and turn it over to our presenter. So, firstly, this session is being recorded, um, and these slides that we're going to go over have um, will help you navigate your screen, and we certainly thank you for joining us today. So there are several ways that you can communicate with us. First, you can post comments in the chat box. You will see um, a panel in the lower right of your screen that says the word chat. And in the send, if you click on that, in the send or to drop down list, you can select the recipient of the message. You can enter your message in the chat box and then press enter on your keyboard. Um, I will be monitoring the chat box as well as the question and answer box throughout Jesse's presentation and we'll let him know when there are comments made. You can post general comments in the chat box. If you have, but if you have a question for the speaker, we ask that you type that in the question and answer box. And you see, you just type your message and then hit enter. To use, there is a closed captioning function. And to use the closed captioning function to show the caption, select WebEx Assistant in the lower left of the screen and then click show closed captions and to hide the captions select hide closed captions in the lower left corner of the screen or select x in the caption um, there is also a translation feature should you need that um, if you would like to speak, we ask that you raise your hand to talk. At the bottom right-hand corner, you should see a, a little hand symbol. And when we open up for discussion, raise your hand if you'd like to speak or ask a question directly. If you would like to communicate using American Sign Language, please alert us by typing in the chat box if you need your video to communicate with the ASL interpreter, we will then turn your video on. Please note that the Community Alliance Summit contains sessions with material that may be sensitive to some people. Please be sure to check the schedule to make sure that you are attending a session that is suitable for your viewing preferences. And then last, um, we ask that you connect with the Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council on social media. And there is our Twitter handle, our Facebook page, and our web page. So feel free to do that. Great. So it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Jesse Tariski who is the executive director of the Autism Society of Pittsburgh. So Jesse, take it away. Thank you, Celia. I appreciate that very much. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, attending and thank you for your interest in this topic. Uh, my name is Jesse Tariski. I am the president and CEO of the Autism Society of Pittsburgh. By way of background, uh, back in 1966, my parents, Dan and Connie Tariski, along with 70 other parents, started the Autism Society of America. Back then it was called the National Society for Autistic Children, and the name was changed to Autism Society of America back in the 90s. The following year, 1967, they created the Pittsburgh chapter. 
So we are the longest running autism advocacy organization in the United States. My parents were pioneers in this field because up until that time, there really was nothing in the way of autism services. Back then, when my older brother was diagnosed, one in 15,000 people were diagnosed with autism. Today, that number is one in 54. So there has been a meteoric climb in the uh, incidence of autism, which makes uh, autism advocacy and training extremely important. My parents started the very first extended school year program back in 1974. It's, we call it the Speak Summer Program, and an acronym which stands for uh, what the program does. This program is now in its 41st year and has been the model by which all other ESY programs uh, have been patterned after. They also started the very first charter uh, spectrum charter school, the very first autism only school. And back in as far back as 2001, my father uh, did the very first police officer training at the Allegheny County Police Training Academy. We've also done training for employees of airlines. That program was called Autism Takes Flight. And then in 2014 and 2015, I was honored to be invited to conduct training for magisterial district judges. In 2014 and 2015, we trained all 540 MDJs in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania on traits of autism and effective methods of communication. Then more, more recently, we were invited back to again do some training for the MDJs. So in 2020 and again in 2021, I went back and conducted training uh, again, this time autism in the courtroom, which was more specific to uh, creating vignettes that would be common uh, for MDJs to encounter if a, a person on the spectrum is either a witness, a victim, or a defendant. We also do training on first, for first responders that would include police officers, probation officers, supports coordinators, uh, corrections officers, we have trained well over 300 corrections officers uh, in Westmoreland County alone. We are available for training anytime uh, and at no cost at this time for the audience. Uh, we believe this training is extremely important. Uh, we also conduct training for uh, a, an entity known as Computer Aid Inc. Computer Aid Inc. has a program called Autism 2, the number two, and then work. And what they try to do is place persons on the spectrum into IT positions. They invite us in then to do the training for their potential coworkers and potential managers so that they understand a little bit more about traits of autism and effective methods of communication. So what I'd like to do now is explain to you what our program, our training program consists of as it relates to first responders. Uh, before I do that, however, I wanna give you some of my own personal background. I am an attorney by trade and in 1985, I was hired by the Allegheny County District Attorney's Office to be a prosecutor. So from 1985 to 1995, I prosecuted cases and had daily dealings with not only judges, but police officers, victims, and defendants. I also am a former instructor from, for the Allegheny County Police Academy, where I taught the crimes code as well as uh, civil law when I became a civil attorney. I've also conducted numerous insurance fraud investigations. When I left the district attorney's office, I became a civil litigator. And one of my focuses was on insurance fraud investigations. And so I've had, a, 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 again, a 
generous amount of interactions with police officers and law enforcement. I feel that the background, my background in that regard is ex extremely important when I am conducting training for police officers and other first responders. One of the things that I feel is critical to point out to these individuals is that I am not here to change their police training. This is extremely important and why I am uh, very um, steadfast in my belief that people who are conducting trainings for law enforcement understand that you're there to supplement their training, not change it. What they teach at the police academy, academy I'm very familiar with because I've taught there. And it is critical that what we teach is something that is a companion to what they already understand. A perfect example would be a friend of mine, a police officer friend of mine, when we were having a discussion about this training, he said to me that they recently had training on how a person who is undergoing a diabetic shock looks in some respects like they are intoxicated. And he said, just that doesn't mean that every time I encounter a person who I suspect is is drinking and driving that I immediately think they're having a diabetic shock. But what it does is it gives me one more thing to consider if the suspected drunk driving isn't adding up. And I actually, as a civil litigator, I defended an individual who, in fact, had undergone a diabetic shock while behind the wheel. And indeed, the police officer who responded to the accident at the scene thought at first that this person uh, was intoxicated. And it turned out he didn't have any alcohol in his system, that he had a combination of medications that created this diabetic shock. So I use that example to explain to people how assisting law enforcement, first responders, probation officers, in understanding traits of autism and effective methods of communication and de-escalation, just give them one more tool in their toolbox to use to try to make sure that the situation resolves uh, the, the best way that it can for all people involved. I'm sure we've seen some rather infamous cases in the news over the years of interactions that have gone awry due to a misunderstanding or misinterpretation of certain traits uh, that are common to persons on the spectrum who might be having a difficult situation. And so I view that as, as my goal whenever we conduct these trainings to make sure I fully explain to the best of my ability what, what autism is, what the traits are that are characteristic. Not every autistic person has the same traits as the next person. They are as unique and, and individualistic as, as all of us are. However, there are certain traits which once observed can indicate to the first responder that they might be dealing with a person on the spectrum and that may uh, uh, then open the door for them to try the techniques that we train them uh, on in order to diffuse the situation. So I begin the training by showing a situation that did go bad. There was a case in Arizona not too long ago where a police officer observed a young man who was on the spectrum walking in a park that this officer was uh, assigned to in order to reduce uh, drug activity. He was trained to detect drug activity. He observed this young man walking along and he was doing something strange with his fingers. He had a, a small string and he was tapping it like this repeatedly. This officer had absolutely no idea what autism was or what that activity was, which is called stimming, where um, persons on the spectrum oftentimes will do a repetitive action in order to, uh, most experts believe it is to try to calm themselves down when they are experiencing a stressful situation. Uh, my vice president's son, who's nonverbal, he will use a slinky. And when he's nervous, he'll move the slinky back and forth repetitively for sometimes hours at a time. 
So this is called stimming. The officer didn't understand that. He approached this young man and asked him what he was doing. And in fact, the young man did tell him, I'm stimming. And the officer had no clue what that meant. He then asked him um, if he had any identification. And the young man abruptly said no, and then turned his back on the officer and started walking away. Well, the officer reacted, grabbed the young man, and eventually took him to the ground. Uh, young man was screaming, saying, I'm okay, I'm okay. This then eventually, we fade away to that, and then we come back and we show the caregiver who arrives on the scene. She was across the street at a uh, music lesson and asked the officer what happened. Did he hurt anybody? Was he bothering someone? And he said, no, he um, was doing something weird with his hands, and I wanted to, to find out what was going on. And she said, well, he was stimming. And he's, the officer said, well, I don't know what that means. And so we then show um, the fallout from that incident. That interaction led to national news headlines. Uh, the police department was then under a microscope for uh, uh, additional training. And again, national headlines, not the kind of headlines that, that any police department wants. And so we show that in the beginning to get the attention of the officer to explain why it's so important that they understand the characteristics of autism. So we tell them um, what it is that we're going to be teaching them. It's important to be trained in uh, detecting, if possible, the traits of autism, detecting whether a person you're in, in, involved with is possibly on the spectrum. Uh, the prevalence, we, we discussed the prevalence and the facts of autism in Pennsylvania, the fact that it has gone, uh, it is now one in 54 individuals have uh, autism. We explain some very uh, unusual facts, like four out of five persons diagnosed on the spectrum are males. No one knows why that is. And it affects in individuals of every racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic background. We identify strategies and likely responses when you're encountering persons on the spectrum, and we provide them with de-escalation techniques if a person on the spectrum is experiencing what's called a meltdown. We explain to them that autism impacts how a person perceives and socializes with others. And that in itself causes persons on the spectrum to have seven times more interactions with law enforcement than neurotypical individuals. That does not mean that they are seven times more likely to commit a crime. It's just that because of their developmental disorder, they are more likely to encounter police because of their misapprehension or misunderstanding of social cues that we take for granted and can pick up on. We explain that it is now the number one developmental disorder. Once it was once upon a time it was considered rare. Now it's the number one developmental disability in America today. It is a lifelong neurological disorder. And unlike psychiatric symptoms, autism characteristics don't go away. Now, higher functioning persons on the spectrum, oftentimes through early intervention uh, in, in childhood, can oftentimes have the characteristics um, reduced, but they never actually go away. And I have some friends that are very high functioning on the spectrum, and I've had some very interesting uh, conversations with them, ongoing conversations of the problems and the frustrations they experience in everyday life. It has been an incredible eye-opener for me. I, my experience with persons on the spectrum is primarily through my older brother. I was born and raised with a person on the spectrum. He's four years older than me. So my two sisters and I have uh, always known about autism since we were old enough to understand anything. And my brother also has intellectual disability. 40% of persons on the spectrum 
have differential diagnoses in addition to their autism. And so my experience with a person on a spectrum is primarily my brother who has always been either at a state institution and when that closed a group home. He will never be able to live on his own. And although he can tend to activities of daily living, he would never be able to sustain himself on his own. But he can converse with me, we can have conversations. But until I became friends with other individuals on the spectrum, higher functioning, who actually are able to live independently, I never was really exposed to high functioning individuals on the spectrum. Uh, my one friend in particular who lives on the other side of the state uh, will frequently text me with her frustrations about going into a, a department store, for example, and being extremely uh, agitated that they're playing music, background music. Now, I have been in hundreds of stores and I've heard the background music and I block it out. I don't even think about it. And to her, it is absolutely unbearable. And she finds it to be very frustrating um, when she's trying to shop that they are, in her words, shoving this music down her ears. Uh, it's been, like I said, a very eye opening experience uh, with this friendship. And it has taught me a lot about individuals on the spectrum who are not like my brother. My brother, on the other hand, has absolutely no issue with with music. He listens to music all the time. Um, in fact, has very good hearing. Um, so I try to make sure that when we're addressing the audience that we're making, I'm making sure to explain that they're that it's called autism spectrum disorder for a reason. It is truly now a spectrum where the individual could fall on either the higher level the middle level or the lower level, which is more severe, such as my um, my vice president, Mary Wellman. Her son is 24 years old. He is nonverbal, has intellectual disability, and is um, very unable to take care of himself. So we talk about the fact that it affects the person's ability to communicate, interact socially, uh, their processing, both their expressive language, what I'm doing now is expressive language, okay? I'm expressing to you a particular thought. Some people on the spectrum are not able to appropriately express themselves, such as Mary's son. Receptive language can also be affected. What you're doing now is receptive. You're receiving my expressive language. Many people on the spectrum have a difficult time processing uh, language, and oftentimes it takes them a while to process it. This can be very awkward if you're used to having a conversation with somebody, and as soon as you're done with your sentence, that person answers you or responds to you. That's the typical dance of communication that we are all familiar with. For some people on the spectrum, they need oftentimes 10 to 15 seconds before they can formulate a response. And that can be very awkward, especially if you're in law enforcement and you're used to getting responses rather quickly. So we make sure that we explain that to the persons. Um, we also talk to them about possibly modeling what they do if they, for example, need to place the person's uh, person in handcuffs. If they're able to model it on a, a fellow officer to show them what they're going to do, that's oftentimes a, a, a can assist in potentially de-escalating the situation rather than increasing it. Because a lot of persons on the spectrum do not like to be touched. And that creates a really challenging situation for a person in law enforcement. We also explain to them the difference between a meltdown and a tantrum. If a young person is in a store with their parents and they ask for a candy bar and they're told no, and then they throw themselves to the ground and start screaming, that's a tantrum. That is a person attempting to get their way by using their emotional reaction, uh, their emotions to try to persuade their parents to behave a certain way. And the worst thing that a parent could do in that circumstance is to accede to that uh, tantrum. 
When a person on the spectrum has what we refer to as a meltdown, that is an overload of sensory uh, issues where the person is literally unable to handle all of the sensory inputs and shuts down. It can manifest itself in a variety of different ways. My brother used to uh, respond rather violently. He, uh, one time when he was still at the institution, he threw a chunk of uh, cement at my dad, cracking some ribs. He slapped an attendant in the back while he was taking a shower. He threw a brick through a car window. That was his response whenever he was having a meltdown. At the time, I was still a prosecutor and I drove out to the institution with a copy of the crimes code. And I said, Eddie, if you do this, this is aggravated assault. If you do this, this is recklessly endangering another person. If you do this, this is called criminal mischief. You do those things here, they put you back to the main building until for a couple of weeks until you get a hold of yourself. Then they bring you back to this. At the time, they had a group home on the main campus of the institution where he was able to live. I then explained, if you do this out in the community, you're going to be arrested and, and sent to jail. And so what I was doing there was familiarizing my brother with the consequences of his actions if he gets into a situation where he feels he has to react. And I explained to him further that a lot of us get to a point where we're frustrated with things, but how we react to them dictates what the consequences are. So by familiarizing my brother with the consequences and explaining to him that he is not alone in his feelings like that, I was then able to redirect him to say, if you get to the point where you feel you need to do these things, instead, remove yourself from the situation. Just absent yourself from the situation. That is the best way for you to deal with this until and unless you come up with other methods to do that. So we explain this to law enforcement too, and we explain to them sometimes their, their meltdown can manifest in physical aggression. Sometimes it could manifest itself in just simply shutting down and looking catatonic. Uh, it may be where they increase their stimming. We, we discuss what are the early warning signs of a person who may be nearing a meltdown. We discuss ways in which they can um, de-escalate the situation by removing as many people as possible from the, the area. Oftentimes, having fewer people around means less stimulation. Turning off the sirens and the, the lights. Uh, a lot of individuals on the spectrum are very sensitive to light, particularly to fluorescent lighting. That is a common uh, sensitivity for persons on the spectrum. We explain what stimming is and the fact that that's actually a good thing and that Unless their stimming is a uh, harming themselves or someone else themselves, such as banging their head into a wall um, or banging their head on somebody's shin, somebody else's shin. If it, their stimming isn't bothering anyone, it is best to let them continue doing that because the uh, if they're not able to do that or if they're prevented from doing that, that could often lead to a meltdown. Uh, we then talk about the fact that there is you know, autism and criminality, there is no specific link between autism and criminal activity. In other words, there is no specific crime that is a characteristic of autism. Like if you're autistic, then you're gonna commit this kind of crime. That's absolutely not the case. Oftentimes, and as I mentioned before, the reason why persons on the spectrum are seven times more likely to encounter, have police encounters, is because of their misunderstanding of social cues. They see somebody, uh, a total stranger sitting on a park bench and they, they are attracted to them and they walk over and sit right next to them. Well, that person may have a reaction such as calling the police saying, I'm, uh, I'm being stalked by somebody when in fact, the person on the spectrum just simply wanted to, to get to know that person. That's a, a very mild case, but this is just one of many examples of where not understanding cues is, uh, can lead to law enforcement um, interactions. I discuss also about the difference between a capacity to commit a crime versus competency to testify. Those are two different things. And oftentimes a person on a spectrum may simply not be aware that what they're doing is a crime, okay? 
if you're a young if you're young and you have a fascination with women's hair, for example, the way it feels or the way it smells, that's that might be adorable when you're four years old. But when you're 18 years old and your 16 year old uh, younger sister brings her girlfriend over and you start grabbing her hair at her hair, now you've got a different problem. Okay, and that that is a situation where the misapprehension can oftentimes lead to um, police encounters. So then we go into um, some of the characteristics um, that can lead a person into a situation uh, like that. And we go over other techniques for de-escalation. And um, we have done this training now, uh, as I said, with, with probation officers, corrections officers. We, we got a response from the warden in Westmoreland County, who said that one of his corrections officers had recently uh, attended our training and was processing an individual who suddenly went in, went, you know, went nuts. He was able to perceive what was going on as a meltdown rather than a tantrum. He cleared the area, allowed this individual some, some additional space. He stopped talking to the person. He did uh, some of the other techniques that we discussed during our training and eventually the individual calmed down and actually apologized to him when it was over. So that we were, that was probably one of the most flattering bits of feedback we got was that this training actually does work. It actually does assist first responders, law enforcement, judges in their interactions with people on the spectrum. So our that is, um, in a nutshell, what our training consists of. There's a lot more involved in that. We show videos, um, uh, particularly the Arizona case. We have several videos for that. We have a video of a uh, high-functioning individual on the spectrum uh, at a World of Warcraft uh, uh, conference where it shows how narrow-focused some individuals on the spectrum can be about one particular topic. We also did some video uh, ourselves that we filmed of a young man on a spectrum role playing, which is a very difficult thing for a person on a spectrum to do. He was pretending that he had just been adjudicated delinquent and the probation officer was trying to explain the terms of probation to him. At the end of that, we then had uh, a, a person interview him and ask him if he understood what the probation officer was telling him and it turned out he had no clue and the it is a very sobering video because it shows um the audience how challenging it can be sometimes to explain something to a person on the spectrum and make sure that they understand it and so that is one of the the uh nuggets in that training that i think really has uh a, a significant effect on the audience. The last thing I want to talk to you about today, in addition to stressing the importance of police officer training, and incidentally, although we're located in Western Pennsylvania and we focus tend to focus on the nine counties in our area, um, we are uh, trying to put our trainings in a webinar format that would be available for anyone who visits our website. Uh, so um, keep checking back to our website. We're hoping to get that off the ground sometime uh, before the end of the year so that anybody who wants to undergo the training, whether it's for law enforcement, whether it's for uh, the uh, healthcare provider, uh, educators, we, we, we do training for colleges and things like that. We will have them divided so that depending on your your particular discipline, it would be tailored more towards your needs. I also would like to share with you, if you haven't already heard about it, two very successful programs in our state. The first that I heard of this was uh, in Derry Township, which is in Dauphin County a program created by a woman named Ashley Yinger, Y-I-N-G-E-R. And she is employed by the district attorney's office. 
she created a co-responder ride along with police officers. And so what they do is they embed social workers or uh, in this one instance, uh, this person is a retired uh, probation officer and they ride along with the police to respond to certain situations if they perceive by the radio call that it is potentially a mental health issue okay now my my interest in this autism isn't mental illness it is a development mental disorder but this same type of early intervention can oftentimes prevent the person on the spectrum or the person with the mental health di disorder from even entering into the criminal justice system. I don't think it's any debate that uh, the uh, criminal justice system is ill-equipped to handle a person, a person's mental health disorder. That's not what it's designed to do, okay? Our criminal justice system is designed to punish people who have committed crimes, okay, primarily. All right. However, we have evolved long <laughs> after I left the DA's office, we have come a long way. And now individuals in the criminal justice uh, system are starting to see the efficacy of early intervention before the arrest is made. Once the arrest is made, it's very difficult to unring that bell. And what I like about this ride along program is in, and it's been widely regarded as highly successful in Dauphin County. And they've been doing it now for several years. I have a recent article that I, that I saw from April of 2021, and it says that their program is still hugely successful. In 2020, the co-responders had a total of 389 referrals. In just the first two months of 2021, there have already been 152 cases. And what these individuals do is when they go out and they find out that this is not appropriate for an arrest, they are able to then redirect that person to services that they either provide themselves by way of counseling or they refer them to entities that can follow up with that individual. That Jesse, program, yes. Go ahead. I, um, this is Celia. I wanted yes. to pop in yes. because you do have a few questions in the oh, okay. question and answer box. Is this a good time to pause and have me ask these? Sure. Or do yeah. you want me to wait? Uh, if you could wait, I'm almost done. I just wanted to mention okay. that we. Sure also uh, have begun this program slightly a, di a, a slightly different way, but here in Allegheny County, there is a Chief Milakovich who uh, was successful in convincing the Hampton Township commissioners to allow him to do something similar. And this was done through some professors at Slippery Rock University who had two Masters of Social Work students who they um, lent to Hampton Township and they are doing the exact same thing. They're going out on ride alongs and it has already been proven so successful. They're getting ready to hire one of them full time. And the only other thing I will say is that also in Allegheny County, our district attorney, Steve Zappala, um, is extremely ahead of the curve on mental health issues and autism. I've dis discussed autism with him many times and he actually has uh, individuals employed by his office who will go to preliminary hearings and screen individuals that have mental health issues. And then they're able to redirect them uh, so that they can hopefully get out of the criminal system and into something that's more appropriate. And that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Um, there are uh, several questions. So I'd like to ask them, and if you can answer them, we hope that you will. Um, the first question comes from a participant who asks whether there is an increased rate of interaction with police for those individuals on the spectrum who were also Black, Indigenous, or people of color. I am not seeing that. I am not 
privy to any statistics on that. As I said before, it crosses every uh, racial and socioeconomic um, uh, background. Um, so we, we have not noticed that it is more prevalent in that situation. Um, my friend on the other side of the state I was talking to you about is um, actually, I believe part of her heritage is Haitian. Uh, she has had some unpleasant experiences with law enforcement, but my other friend on uh, also out that way uh, is Caucasian and has had similar um, negative and positive, they both have had negative and positive interactions with law enforcement. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Um, sure. The next, the next question is, um, hello from disability equality and education in Pennsylvania. What is being done in the classroom to ensure that teachers, staff, and non neuro and non neurodiverse students have a better understanding of autism and how to interact? Are you aware of any efforts in that realm? I love that question. This is the, the nut we have been trying to crack. We have been trying to get with the Department of Education to allow us to come in and provide autism training. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, we have done so at the college level. We've been invited by several uh, universities to come in and train the uh, employees and the, the instructors, um, I would like nothing more than to come into high schools and provide this training. One of the concerns that was raised to me by um, a professor that we worked with uh, from Duquesne University, she's the, the head of the school psychology department. She said the one concern that was raised to her was that if I'm discussing something about autism, and I mentioned something about um, some sort of criminal act and a person on the spectrum spontaneously states that they, they've committed that act, the teachers are uh, mandatory um, uh, referrals. They have to report, mandatory reportables. And they're concerned this could cause, pro cause problems. I, I don't understand that rationale. And I think if you do it early enough, if, if a child's below a certain age, they're, in, they're ineligible to even go into the juvenile, juvenile system. So I think if you do it early enough, you can avoid that impediment. But I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, when I talk to, to law enforcement, one of the things I say to them is, I feel bad that you're the only side of this equation that I'm able to instruct. Um, if I could then go to people on the spectrum and say, this is what you should do when you see a show of authority, um, I think it would have a huge impact. My son told me one time when he was still in high school, he came home all upset because his friend got suspended for fighting. And I said, well, you shouldn't fight in school. And he said, well, he didn't start it. The kid punched him and then walked away. And my friend ran after him and punched him back. My own son didn't understand that the use of force in self-defense uh, ceases if the if the assault ceases, what the the boy should have done is go to a, a show a, an authoritative person and explain what happened and let them deal with it. So I ended up doing a seminar for my son and his friends in school on basic principles of use of force and self defense. That type of stuff should be done with respect to autism as well, and done with the whole school, not just singling out persons on the spectrum, but just saying here. Here's what you do. And there are some schools that do do this. Okay. They'll actually invite officers in to explain what you should do if, if you're pulled over by the police, what you should do if you're approached by an officer. And that is the, uh, I loved your question. And I sure hope <laughs> that can find its way back to the uh, Department of Education. I think we should be instrumental. I think it should be in their, um, in their IEPs that they have this training, and we would be more than happy to uh, create the appropriate training for schools and for school districts. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Um, there was um, 
another question, and I'm not sure whether this is a question for you. Um, it says, I'm wondering another thing, do autistic support classrooms use fluorescent lighting? Say that one more time. Guess, do autistic support classrooms use fluorescent lighting? My guess would be that's pretty variable, but yeah. I don't yeah. know. I, I would say that, well, I know that um, several of the autism schools we have in Allegheny County, um, they have sensory friendly classrooms for exactly that mm -hmm. reason. And they often have indirect lighting. I have a fluorescent light on now. I oftentimes turn that off because even though I'm not autistic, I, I'm not crazy about having that on. So I'll turn that off oftentimes and just turn the lamps on behind me just because indirect lighting is easier on my eyes. And so I know that the schools that I'm familiar with uh, that have um, uh, people on the spectrum will do exactly that. They'll have indirect lighting, very, very um, low stimulus. They'll have uh, sound dampening uh, walls, things like that. Great, thank you. Okay, um, another question. Uh, do you present trainings or consult providers and their staff and their direct support professionals? Yes, we certainly do. We have trained, oh my gosh, uh, I'd say about a 250 to 300 supports coordinators. Um, Great. Both at the, you know that that are working with the different counties, um, so uh, we. Uh, the answer to that question is absolutely. So, um, Jesse, I'm going to ask that in the chat box, if you don't mind, if you put your contact information, that would be great, so people know how to reach you. Sure. Would that be okay? And oh my the next. The next question, which is um, of a similar vein, is what are the nine counties that you serve, and do you provide this training outside of those nine counties? Virtual is great, but not usually as helpful. I agree. I much prefer to be in front of the audience. I'm a trial attorney by training. It kills me to have to sit. I much rather stand up and pace back and forth like I'm in front of a jury. Um, when I teach at community college, same thing. I like being in front of, of the students. Um, the nine counties in, in Western Pennsylvania, I, I can't necessarily rattle all of the, all nine of them off, but they are the, the counties surrounding Allegheny. We have Green, Butler, um, Beaver, uh, and you know the, the surround Westmoreland uh, for one. Uh, so, but yes, we're I'm more than happy to go to another county. That obviously, you know, if it's too far on the other side of the state, I have a colleague that I work with. We've done joint trainings together. She's on the other side of the state, and so if you're over uh, in the eastern side of Pennsylvania, uh, I can refer you to her. But I'm not adverse to going a certain distance, um, if you know, depending on the circumstances. So. Uh, by all means, feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to put my contact information here. Um, so, let's see here. Not sure how to get any other questions or comments for Jesse at this point. We have a few minutes left in the presentation. So, if anyone has other questions, they want to either ask live or type into the chat or into the Q&A box. We are monitoring all of those places. So I'm not sure, did I ask the question you're asking about? It seems as though there was a question posted in the chat. Um. Did we ask that? I assume I got it. If not, please let me know. Okay, I, I'm. I typed in my info, but I can't figure out how to. Did you type it in the chat box? 
There we go. Did that did that go through? I don't. I don't. There it is. But that, I think that was private. Somebody did that private. So let me see. Uh, how to... mm -hmm. hmm. All right, Jesse. Um, we'll see, we will make sure that folks get that information. Um, Jesse, if you, uh, Jesse, this is Becky with Harrisburg University. If you select the um, chat oh, option and then under the two, there's a drop down menu and you can select to all attendees and then post your uh, contact information, mm -hmm. then it will go out to everyone. Okay. All right, can we do just, that? I'll yeah. do it again then. Let me see if it'll work. Okay, did that work? Yes, it did. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Jesse. Absolutely. Okay. Folks. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments for Jesse? Give it a minute in case anybody's typing. Okay, then. Um, Seeing no other questions or comments, I'd like to thank you, Jesse, on behalf of the Developmental Disabilities Council uh, for joining us this morning. I think there was some very good information and we all know that interactions with police can be extremely problematic for people with all disabilities. Um, and so we, we appreciate your time, your comments, and your suggestions. I have one so thing. So thanks. Yes, one, go ahead. One more thing to add I that I think is important for everybody to, um, to know. One of the most recent pieces of legislation my father uh, was able to get passed, and I think it was about um, six years ago, uh, a representative named Miller uh, passed, uh, introduced the legislation, and it mandates that magisterial district judges and police officers undergo 32 hours of training on how to deal with persons with disabilities and persons with autism, 32 hours every six years. And again, I don't know of any other state that, to my knowledge, has that as a mandate, but I, I think that's an extremely important thing. Uh, uh, extremely important development. Oh, uh, Dan Miller. Yes, thank you. Dan Lisa. Miller. Yes. Yep. Yep. Dan Miller. Uh, he he carried the ball across the finish line, and and so now yeah. that's that's the ball. Yeah, Representative Miller has been an incredible champion for people with disabilities and their families. He sure so has. So thank you for that. Okay. Okay. Um. For those of you who are staying um, with the Community Alliance, next are the pop-up sessions. Um, so feel free to attend those. And um, thank you all for attending. We certainly appreciate it. Have a good day.